hundred hives of bees. I say several hundred because I never know exactly how many. <clears throat> and from West Kentucky to uh, the Gulf Coast to Mississippi, for uh, uh, to keep them healthy, keep them built up, so they can go to almonds in California. They come back from almonds in California to West Kentucky. We split the bees. We're making nukes and. Uh, we sell nukes to a couple of different businesses, wholesale the nukes to a couple of different businesses, and uh, pollinate watermelons in the Owensboro, Kentucky area in the summer. And as soon as they come off of watermelons, they go back to Mississippi. And we leave, we usually leave a few hundred hives in South Mississippi just to make a honey crop. And that's our business. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, it's getting in there. We're kind of changing from late winter coming into early, early spring. What what should uh, people be looking at in their, on their hives about this time? I know it varies by country, but still be the first steps anywhere when it starts warming up in different in different areas. As soon as you start having a bloom, uh, you need to make sure that you're getting some brood build up in the hive, that the queen is beginning to kick into gear. As soon as you start seeing pollen, fresh pollen coming into the hive, queens should be laying eggs and they should be laying a, a decent pattern. When they first begin to lay, if they've had a late, had a kind of a lag in egg production, sometimes they uh, don't lay a good pattern. Give them, give them a week or so before you decide that they're not in your count. And uh, make sure your queen is laying a good pattern. Make sure the bees are healthy, that the larva is healthy. Those are the things that uh, you should be most concerned about. The buildup will, it, it'll be slow at first, it'll become exponential later, but um, don't expect the hive to just explode just right out of the box. Um, that'll come. What you want now is healthy brood and productive queen. Okay, we're going to open this up for questions. Uh, you, like I say, you hit the uh, participant button down on the bottom panel, and there should be a panel raised up on your right-hand side, and there should be a, a thing there that says raise your hand, and I'll get to them as, as I see them. Uh, right now, we don't have anybody. I'm sure somebody out there has got questions now. Don't be bashful. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, Jimmy Cooper. You're unmuted, Jimmy. Go ahead. All right. Hey, Ken. How you doing? How you doing? Okay. Good. Uh, I listened to you speak at the uh, at the Memphis Beekeepers Association, and we were we were all really impressed uh, impressed by you. You had mentioned uh, Grand Debo. Yeah. For small hive beetles. Um. I don't think I ever understood how it was applied, I guess. Well, it can be applied two different ways. One way is applying it inside the hive, just on the uh, top of the frames, top bars of the frames in the brood nest. Uh, similar to the way that you used to apply teramycin across the end of the frames. Okay. <clears throat> you don't want to put it out in the middle of the hive, but um, probably as effective of an application would be just around the hive. Uh, when the larva come out, they'll they'll feed on it and they'll die. Mm -hmm. But um, outside the hive, there's not any chance of it being fed to larva, bee larva in the hive. There's not any chance of, you know, bees are actually kind of repelled by the Grandivo, but they can track it uh, around in the hive. And if it's outside the hive, there's not that uh, not that chance. It won't kill a hive, but um, it's just one of those things that if you're trying to do, do the best that you can, I'd rather put it just around the underneath the front entrance of a hive, where the larva the larva will go to it. They're attracted to it, and they'll go to it when uh, when they come out of the hive. If you're going to put it in the hive, put it between the first and second story at the, on the end bars. Okay. All right, one more question. Um, 
the phages. I guess that's, that's history now. Uh, no, phages are a real thing. I mean, they'll uh, they're they're good for uh, American fowl brood. I mean, there is a phage that just hadn't been identified for other for European fowl brood or for uh, any kind of a bacterial infection or bacteria. There is a phage that is particular to that bacteria that will feed on it. Um, American fowl brood has been identified, you know, that the phage that feeds on uh, uh, Penobacillus larva has been identified and uh, still not a silver bullet. I mean, if I get, uh, if I find a hive that's got American fowl brood, I'm, I'm still going to do the tried and true thing, you know, and burn it. But the the phages are, that's that's a new tool in the toolbox for it. Gotcha. Appreciate it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's got their hands up. Well, how long you been keeping bees, Kent? Thirty years, more or less. Might be thirty-one. I'm not sure. Mm. Why is it over in the chat, Joe? Okay. What is Kent using for varroa mite treatment these days? Is any thoughts on the subject? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. My varroa treatment, uh, I use, I treat three times a year. And that's mostly because our bees are in big concentrations of other bees at two different times a year. In the spring, when they come back from almonds, I treat with thymol, uh, the the label on label treatment would be Apolife Var or Apigard. Um, I kind of pr prefer Apolife Var because you can spread it around in the hive easier. That's a spring treatment. Summer treatment, um, I treat with uh, formic acid, formic pro, but I only leave it in for about two days. It's just a shock treatment. And uh, in the fall, I treat with Apivar, which is an Amitraz product. So that there's three different things that kill varroa mites in three different ways. And whether or not it works, it makes me feel better knowing that what one one particular treatment don't get, maybe the next one will. And I'm, I check for mites a week after each treatment. I do a mite roll on, on just a representative number of the hives, usually about uh, one out of 20. I'll do a mite roll and I always pick the hive that uh, to do the mite count on that I think would be the most likely to have a higher mite count. But we treat everything we we treat everything just across the board with mites uh, with something for varroa mites. And used to when we first had varroa mites, the mites themselves kill the hive just by being a, a parasite on the larva. Or, or on the pupa. Now the mites themselves don't don't usually kill a hive by themselves, but the viruses and bacteria that they bring into the hive, uh, they'll weaken it to where any other thing will cause cause the colony to crash. And it don't really take that many mites to introduce a virus or a bacterial disease into a hive. So it's more important now than it used to be keep your mite count as near zero as possible. And oxalic just don't do that for me because we, we never go broodless during a year. Oxalic is good at killing mites, but not under the capping. And uh, we never catch a broodless period during the year for that uh, even if you're using oxalic once a week or three weeks in a row, you're still leaving a lot of mites alive uh, that could because it, it's only effective for about two days after treatment. You're still leaving a lot of mites alive that can vector viruses. So the viruses are really our main concern, but they're brought in by Varroa. Now, you said you can't, uh, you, do, you pick out hives to check that you, that you think would have the most mites. What's your criteria on selecting them hives to do the uh, alcohol wash on? Uh, the criteria I use to select the hives that I'm going to do a mite roll is 
symptoms of a virus or a bacterial disease. If I see bees, the, the virus I see most often in our hives is paralysis. And if I see bees that exhibit symptoms of paralysis, that's going to be the hive that I want to check for mites to see how, how many mites there are in it. Okay, that's what I find that mostly here it's either uh, deformed queen cell virus or or black queen cell virus or deformed wing virus or paralysis. What's the symptoms on the paralysis so people know what they're looking for? The, the very first symptom on paralysis is K wings. They have their wings separated just like they would if they had tracheal mites or if they have nosema. Those are the three things that the bees will separate their wings. They're uncomfortable, so they separate their wings. With paralysis, uh, it's an equilibrium issue, and they're, they separate their wings to keep their balance a little bit better in the hive. A little bit later symptom, they begin to lose their hair, and they'll have uh, a slick and shiny looking abdomen. Now the thorax may or may not be slick or shiny, but the abdomen will be slick and shiny on uh, bees that have paralysis. And you can tell an old bee, uh, they're gonna wear the hair off their thorax from flying, um, but their wings will also be kind of ragged. So you can, if you have a bee that looks uh, shiny, look at its wings, and if it has clean straight edges on its wings, then it's a young bee and uh, it's paralysis that you're seeing. Later on, they'll, they'll become really shaky and uh, final stages, uh, they're just totally drunk and they'll just uh, fall over and, you know, wiggle around. But, crawl, uh, crawl on the ground. Yeah, crawl on the ground. Paralysis uh, mimics some other, uh, the symptoms mimic some other issues with bees, but, um, Nothing else makes the bees lose their hair like paralysis and get, uh, it used to be called hairless black syndrome because the, the bees, when they lose their hair, their abdomen looks darker because the hair is not there to give it a covering. And that's, uh, if I'm seeing K-wing bees in a hive, that's, that's, that's a tip off to me that I need to do something because that's the early stage. And even at that point, you're not going to save that individual bee that's K-wing. Whatever it has a K-wing for, it's going to die from it. And so uh, you're saving the hive, but that bee tip is a tip-off that you got something wrong. Okay. Okay. For the uh, latecomers coming in here, uh, two ways to ask the question. You can click on the ma uh, participants down the bottom. You know, bring a panel up on the right and you can raise your hand and ask a question or you can click on the chat at the bottom and type in your question and one of the other co-hosts here will relay it to us. Uh, Andrew, you're up. Hey, thank you. Um, kind of piqued my interest talking about the, uh, the bees that, are, that appear black. Um, we had a warm day and, and I was out at the feeder and I noticed two or three of them that were just like jet black. Um, is that what you're talking about? Or those, if they were at the feeder, are they okay? Uh, if, if you see bees going to, if you have a community feeder and bees are going to it, they're going to look shiny, sleek and shiny because they fight. When bees fight, they pull the hair out of the bee of one another. And um, they will look sleek and shiny, but if you if you watch them they're they're not their equilibrium is not bad they're they're just uh you know robin robber bees will look slick and shiny also but if you watch them uh, they're you can tell there's nothing wrong with them except being robbers so what you're seeing if you're seeing them flying out of a hive by the time a bee loses a hair on its abdomen they're not going to be doing a lot of foraging they're going to spend most of their time in a hive because uh, uh they're they're feeling a little bit under the weather. Is that is that true for even this time of year? They've been yeah. kind of clustered for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, that if if you're seeing them at at a feeder, it is probably because it uh, and they're slick and shiny. It I doubt that they have uh, paralysis. They're they've probably just been uh, fighting with other bees. Good to hear. It don't, it don't take long. It don't take long for them to get their hair pulled out. 
A couple of good fights and it's out. <laughs> there you go. You have a question in the chat box from K and A Gardner. If a hive has mite related viruses, will it recover on its own uh, by removing the mites or do you need further treatments? Um, if you have mite related viruses, uh, the best thing that you can do is treat it for mites to to stop the vector and uh, baby it as much as you can. Uh, the bees that get that contract the virus, they're not going to get any better. And uh, when a hive, when a colony gets overwhelmed with the virus, uh, and it gets really prevalent in the hive in the colony. The bees themselves become a vector by feeding. You know, if they're infected with a virus, uh, it becomes systemic in the bee, and they they become a sort of a vector just by feeding larva. And the larva then will, if if they get that virus at the right stage, if they consume it, then they'll contract the virus too. So the best thing that you can do is just uh, treat for the mites and maybe feed a probiotic to uh, try to keep the bees as healthy as possible. Give them, give them the best advantage you can. The answer is maybe they'll recover, not always. Probably only about forty percent chance. You reckon somewhere in that neighborhood? I'd say that'd be. I'd say that'd be in the ballpark. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a real high. If you catch it early enough, you, you, you can sometimes yeah. whip it. But like you said, the trouble you got, you got you got all them nurse bees in there. It's infected, and if you got them, yeah. it's just going to keep perpetuating the whole thing. That's exactly right. If you if you catch that early in the spring, maybe by fall. You'll have something that'll live through the winter, but they're they're not going to thrive. Well, that you, that's kind of like me and you. Our tolerance for mites is zero. It ain't it ain't four yeah. percent. It's zero. No, that's right. I don't want to see any mites in a mite roll. Because you know you can get one mite that's infected come in and infect a hive. Yeah, that's true. I mean, not likely, but it, it's possible. So yeah. you know, you know, five years ago before the viruses got so prevalent, you could come in here and treat once in the spring, once in the fall, everything's fine. You, you kept the mite down and they wasn't carrying nothing, but now that's not a fight. You can't do that now and raise bees. No, you can't. Five years ago, oxalic was a very good control, but uh, it's not as good of a control now as it used to be. It still is a control if you're broodless, but if you don't have any capped brood, it's a good control, but used to, uh, it was just a good all-around treatment. Well, you probably wasn't killing all the mice, but you didn't have the viruses. That's why it That's was right. effective. That's yeah. exactly right. It's and not that the oxalic acid went bad. It's the we got exactly. the viruses now. Exactly. We, we've everything. You know, we're dealing dealing with nature, and nature is continually changing. So it's always a push and pull between the uh, pest and you know predators and prey, basically. Yeah. What, what kind of probiotics do you recommend? Well, the the name brand stuff is really good. I mean, the Pro DFM, the Super DFM, those those are really good probiotics. But you get most of the same stuff in the uh, equine probiotics from a place like Tractor Supply. You get most of the same product. Yeah. A lot cheaper too. Yeah, about uh, I'd say <laughs> about five cents on the dollar, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit cheaper. Yeah. And yeah. What about uh, trachea mites? Do you see much of that anymore, or? i every year I dissect several hundred bees for mostly for other people that bring samples to our house that uh, from a dead hive. And you can tell if the bees died from tracheal mites because of the scarring that's left in the trachea. And uh, I haven't seen much, almost no tracheal mite evidence in seven, eight years. But it, I mean, it's really rare to see uh, tracheal mite damage in a, uh, in a trachea of a, a bee. Um, I think formic, start, when we been, have been using formic, 
that has really made a big difference in uh, the tracheal mite population because the formic is, it's said to be 100% effective against tracheal mites. And I, I don't have any reason to disagree with that because I, I just don't see any. Now, I'm not saying it's not out there. It's just that uh, what you've got in West Virginia, we may not have here. And what we have, you may not have there. Uh, our, our biggest pest right now is uh, the viruses that, and bacterial diseases that Varroa vector in. And tracheal mites just aren't on the radar. Uh, I just don't see any any damage from them. But East Tennessee, East Kentucky, they, they may have a lot. I don't know. Uh, thymol and a grease patty will take care of tracheal mites too, won't it? Yeah, thymol has an effect on them. It, a grease patty has a, I, I don't know if the thymol is the effective agent or if it's the grease patty. A grease pad, sugar patty with Crisco used to be the treatment for tracheal mites when they first uh, came around. You had menthol that you could use or you could put a uh, Crisco patty with grease in it, a Crisco and sugar in the hive. You could use the Crisco patty when you had honey super zone. You couldn't use the menthol yeah. when you had honey super zone. So most everybody used the, the Crisco patty and got pretty good control. Yeah. I don't see any other questions here right to, right to present. Can't you? Give uh, a lot of new ones here and a lot of old uh, old beekeepers that's in here, uh, experienced beekeepers. Kind of give us a rundown of the five major things typically you run across in a hive as far as pest and disease. So if, I, if you would kind of rank them from one to five, start with one being the, 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 the worst, I mean the most prevalent. Well, um, the absolute worst thing that you could have is uh, American fowl brood because there's, there's no getting past that. Um, there is a product that is not, uh, it's not really out there yet. Right there. I got safe. a picture of it right here. Yeah. Uh, that that's labeled for American fowl brood. It's phages that feed on, uh, the bacteria Penobicellus larva. Um, but still, American fowl brood would be the most serious thing that you'd encounter in a hive. Second, uh, actually the first is, if you're talking about most prevalent, is yeah. the rolling viruses yeah. uh, and the bacterial diseases that viruses bring, uh, that Varroa bring into the hive. And there's controls for that. Use the controls. I mean, if you're sick, you go to the doctor. You, you if you get your dog a rabies shot every year before it gets rabies, then treat your hive before they get get sick from the mites and the virus. Uh, after, after Varroa and uh, American fowl brood would be a European fowl brood. That's going to be one of the more prevalent things. And all of the European fowl brood that's diagnosed as European is not really true European fowl brood because the larva is quite a bit too old. European fowl brood kills larva at four and a half days. And uh, what you see that's usually diagnosed as European, uh, the larva are a lot older than that. They're five, six days old. And uh, it can be, it's treatable with antibiotics. You can treat it or you can dust the frame with powdered sugar and take out all of the larva and all the eggs, all the larva. If you remove the host, you'll remove the pest. But you got to remember that the pest got there by being vectored in by varroa mites. So you still need to take take care of the vector. And uh, this uh, what's what's recognized as European fowl brood actually used to be associated with paramedic, parasitic mite syndrome. And uh, you can look at pictures of parasitic mite syndrome and see exactly what uh, the slang term that some people use is snotty brood. Uh, you can, it looks identical. It's the same thing, but uh, it's a type of fowl brood, not American, not European, but it's still, it's still a type of fowl brood and it is controllable. So there's uh, three things. Fourth thing uh, would, would be uh, as far as being prevalent, just about everybody has Nosema serrana. 
very little Nosema apis anymore. Uh, it's almost like the Serrana has outcompeted the Nosema apis, but nearly everybody has Nosema serrana. Fumagillin will take, it will kill Nosema serrana, but it won't kill the spores, and the serrana will come right back. And usually, at a lot higher level than uh, than it was when you when you first killed it out. Nosema serrana can kill a hive by itself, but it's not common that it does. It nearly always requires a second or third issue in the hive before the hive goes under. Um, Fumagillin will become available again probably this summer sometime. There's a manufacturer that's uh, uh, fired up production again. So you'll have that available if that's what you want to use. I don't use anything for it. Uh, I just try to try to keep it at a control level as much as possible. Uh, we do we do use probiotics in our feed and uh, try to flood the mid gut with good bacteria rather than uh, having the microbiomes <laughs> take over the mid gut. And the last the last thing would be uh, um, these pests like small hive beetles. Wax moths, you let a hive go queenless and you're going to have issues with a small hive beetle in the south especially. Uh, the ground temperature usually has to be around 60 degrees before they start reproducing a lot, but uh, you could lump tracheal mites in with that, but we just don't have that big of a, an issue in my area with tracheal mites. We have a bigger issue with uh, small hive beetles and queenless hive mating nukes. We raise a lot of queens. In mating nukes, if queen don't come back from a mating flight, man, you're in trouble. You're gonna, you're gonna have a slimed out mating nuke if, you, if you're not really on the ball. Those are the things that, uh, those are the five things that we really pay the most attention to. How important is it after you've treated a hive with antibiotics for uh, a, a pest or disease, is it to feed probiotics back to them? I like, I like to, uh, that it's our practice that if we treat with antibiotics, we wait about two weeks and let all of that clear completely out of the, the system of the colony. And then we feed probiotics, put probiotics in the feed. And I think it makes quite a bit of difference. It, it seems like it. All I'm working off of is observations. You know, I'm I'm not a scientist. I, I just have to fly by the seat of my pants. But uh, I think it makes a difference. I can tell the difference in brood area in the hives that we feed probiotics. Okay, we got a question here from KP. You're up. Uh, Joe, you mentioned the probiotics probiotics from uh, Tractor Supply? Yeah. Yes, sir. Is it the Provine or the, uh, the Provine, Equine or the Provine? Uh, I, I use it, uh, I use the that for horses. Yeah. But, but, you know, really, if you look at the label on the probiotics, the horse, the probiotics for horses and for chickens and for cattle are all, all similar. It, the thing that the honeybees use the most are the lactic the, the lactic acids in the probiotics. Okay. Well, I, think, I think Tractor Supply, it's red something or another is the name of it. Okay. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Lankford, do you know exactly remember the name of that? It's a multi-species. If you're talking about the probiotic, it's the uh, the magic cell, not the magic cell, geez. I'll look it up and get back to you. Yeah, I got it. They, they used to be magic cell and they quit making them. We had to go to something else. I got it out in the garage, but I don't know particularly what the name of it. Well, the magic cell and the red cell is the uh, amino, or not the aminos, the uh, electrolytes, vitamins, and mineral solution. Probiotics yeah. made by Dumar. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, look. If, we, if you find it, we'll 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 put it up there before we get done here. Over, I'll put it over in the chat. Okay. Uh, Marilyn, you're up. 
Hey, Camp, how you doing this evening? Yeah, doing well. Oh, Marlin, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's okay. I, I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Uh, no, I got a couple of hives that I had been fighting since last fall with Mike. Uh, I gave him the oxalic treatment with the wand uh, on New Year's Day, and I gave him another treatment uh, just last week, and I'm still seeing, well, I probably still counted 12 drops like the next day as I'm on the bottom board. Um it's looking like with the warm and the mild winter that we've had, that I'm going to have to do something other than oxalic acid. And so what can I do and how early can I use it? What product can I use at the earliest stage, you know, in this cool weather? If you're wanting to use a similar product to oxalic, you could use formic. And it's still cool enough that you could use formic at, at a full rate uh, for the full term. Instead of when we use formic, it's in hot weather, and we just use it as a shock treatment just to knock down the mites. And uh, in hot weather, it will go through the cappings a lot quicker. You get a lot quicker shot with it. But uh, this kind of weather, cool weather, you could use it for the full term. The formic pro, I think, stays in for 14 days, and uh, that should take care of the mites under the cappings as well as the mites that are on the bees loose in the bees okay well i've used formic in the past but i've heard that it it kills brood but maybe it's the brood that the mites are in is that maybe the brood that it's it, killing well, uh formic formic when you use it in warm weather it will it it will it'll fry some of the brood but um if you use it in cool weather if the weather's uh, i'd rather use formic somewhere between 55 and 65 degrees and okay we're probably just a little cool yet for that well, it's okay. It's okay to use it in cooler weather rather than using it in hotter weather. If you're going to leave it on for a full term, you could also use some of the other, you could use a thymol product at this time because we're far enough away from a honey flow that uh, you could leave it in there. Uh, whatever you, whatever you put in there, it's got to stay in there about three weeks. You know, the, not the formic, but if you're using thymol or if you're using apivar strips, they need to stay in there at least three weeks because uh, 14 days is the maximum amount of time that uh, the pupa will be under cappings. That's a drone pupa. And, you know, the worker, worker pupa will be out from under cappings in 11 days. So, uh, you want to leave it in there, whatever treatment you're using other than forming, you want to leave it in there at least, I'd leave it in there at least three weeks and you get a good coverage then. And uh, you'll have it out before honey flow starts. Yeah, and okay, I, I can I can put formic in first of March too, if you don't wait till it gets up there around uh, 16, 70 degrees. Sure, the thymol, thymol is a lot similar in uh, the reaction you get from the bees when you put thymol in the hive like apolifar or apigard uh, <laughs> bees really don't like it in hot weather they'll leave the hive just like they will with forming but uh, cool weather um, it, it don't it's it works pretty good you'll get a you'll get a decent control <laughs> with thymol in the cooler weather cooler weather usually the apolifar works a little bit better than apigard if you're using formic or using thymol okay uh, well i appreciate it now, i'll add a little bit of something to that uh if you treat for the three week time with whatever apivar or, or a thymol treatment and, you know wait a little bit and do a mite count you still got mites there's a good chance that you got neighbors that's not treating and they're weak hives and your bees are going over there and robbing them and they'll bring them right back <laughs> no, that's very true, because I, I know that I don't know if I have a neighbor that, I don't know if he does anything or not. But, well, um, yeah, I, we run into that a lot. Jason's had a little bit of trouble with that. We treat the same way, and I have no mite trouble. And he can treat and check the next week, and they're it's, uh, 4% again on some, some hive. Not all, just occasional hive. You get one that's really strong and robbing others out. That, that's something you got to watch for. So I say, I got uh, my bee club. There, everybody said, I don't check, I just treat. That's not good enough. You got to check, you got to treat and then check. You got to make sure yeah, what you're using is working. 
he usually has a few highs in his garden, but I don't see any out there this year, this winter. And I, last year was just a bad year for mites. And if you didn't treat last year, he was going to be in bad shape. Yeah. Hope that helps. Okay. All right, I'll try that. Uh, so Keith. Oh, it's okay. Wait, just wait a minute, Keith. Go ahead. You got a side yeah, bar question? You do. Uh, they're asking for Kent to explain how he's feeding the probiotics and what ratio of his mix. Um, I, I feed the probiotics just uh, in mixed with sugar across the end bars of the frames, dry. I feed it dry across the end bars of the frames. And um, I, I use the same uh, ratio of mix with uh, tractor supply as I would use with uh, Pro DFM. And it, it amounts to about... Uh, one tablespoon of product across each end of the each end of the hive. So two tablespoons per hive, and I'll mix the two tablespoons with about a tablespoon of sugar. And in other words, two tablespoons of product, one tablespoon of sugar, mix it up, and put about one and a half across each end bar. And bees will clean that up, and they'll they'll get the probiotic out of it. Did you have another question from the sidebar there, uh, Todd, or that it? I think that was the last one. Okay, Keith, you're up. Hey, Mr. Kent. Uh, hey. I got a question. In 30 years that you kept bees, did you ever uh, do any swarm catching, try to catch wild swarms? Oh, yeah. I used to, I used to love catching wild swarms. When I got What's busy... What's my secret? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my secret is that uh, you, you let the ones that are 40 feet off the ground go. Let the young young guys do that. And uh, catch the ones that are close to the ground and shake them, off in, shake them off into a hive and put a queen excluder on the bottom and top where the queen can't get out. And wait until there's some uncapped brood in the hive then you can take the queen excluders off you'll have a bunch of dead drones in there but the queen can't get out a lot of times if you don't do that uh you shake a swarm off in a box and it'll, it'll be gone in a day they don't always stay but if the queen if the queen can't get out most of the time they'll stay not always but most of the time they'll stay what about putting out swarm boxes and catching them in the woods? Oh, yeah, that works pretty good. Set your swarm box just inside the drip line in the woods, about 12, 14 feet off the ground, facing the field. And uh, put a Q-tip with a little bit of lemongrass oil in the back end of the hive. Have, have, uh, have your swarm box. Your swarm box needs to have the volume of one 10 frame deep plus a shallow to a medium super on the bottom with no frames in it and a bottom board that needs to be the volume of it and you put a put a q-tip with some uh, lemongrass oil on the back of it fasten it to the tree with a strap or that it's solid they won't go they won't stay in a hive and swinging around and just inside the drip line around the field and facing out you'll catch a few swarms some, All right. some, people, some people are some people are really successful with it. They have have their boxes in good places. If you ever catch a swarm in one place, keep setting your boxes there because swarms tend to take the same route year after year after year. That's the reason I keep them by lifers house. <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty That's confident. You're pretty confident in Langford's bees then. Well, I know I, I can I can kind of steal them from him. <laughs> okay that, Joe that information's over in the sidebar chat okay uh, yeah, you, if you're, you don't have a sidebar chat just go down at the bottom and click on chat it should pop up on your right hand side if you want to look at that uh, David you're up oh got a mute got, got a mute Keith where's Keith at there he is uh, got, we got him alright Go ahead, David. 
Hey, how y'all been doing? I'm pretty good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, how y'all been doing? Pretty good. How y'all been doing? Pretty good. Uh oh, something going wrong. Yeah. Okay. Great. Can, can you hear us? Hey, uh, I'm gonna go toward the queen side of it. Can you? Yes, sir. I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Doubtfully, you're not. Huh? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okie dokie. Uh, look, I'm in uh, West Central Georgia, and uh, you know, we went through a pretty good dearth this late summer and fall and stuff down here, and I noticed that uh, the bumblebees or carbon bees or whatever, we had some blooms and flowers, and they was pretty much hitting them pretty good, but the bees wasn't. And so I done a little checking and come find out bees have a long tongue and can access certain flowers. I've been looking at the corn, uh, what's that, the cornolian and the uh, uh, Caucasians. Uh, they have long tongues, but they're more of a cool. They don't do well in the heat, do they? Mm, yeah, cornolians would be fine. You're muted. Okay. I gotta find you, Kent. There, unmute you. How'd you get muted, Kent? Go ahead. Don't know. Uh, Carniolans and Caucasians do have longer tongues, especially the Caucasians. But um, and they they were they originated in cold weather climates in in the Caucasus Mountains and in the mountains in Yugoslavia and Bulgaria and that in that part of the world. But they're still pretty good hot weather bees. They uh, Main thing about carniolans, especially carniolans, but Caucasians also, is they do pretty good in a place that has a sustained honey flow. But if your honey flows are up and down and up and down all, all spring, um, they'll be building on the honey flow that uh, Italians are usually storing food on. But um, they're good bees to have, even in, even in hot climates, ca Caucasians especially. The Caucasians are a little bit more susceptible to uh, the digestive issues like nosema. They're more susceptible to that. Not quite so much to mites uh, compared to Italians. They're a little bit better with mites, uh, not, not so much with nosema. So if you have a lot of cool, wet weather, Caucasians may or may not suit you, but uh, it's worth trying. Cauc and they, they propolize a lot. You'll hate them for the propolis unless you have a market for it. Yeah. May I answer your question, David? Yeah. Well, I, I live, I call myself, huh? I call myself Deep Woods because I'm in the deep. Okay. Uh, uh -oh. Jimmy, you're up. Unmute. There, go ahead, Jimmy. All right. Uh, hey, Kent, my my wife's too bashful to ask, but he, she <laughs> wants to know. <laughs> she wants to know what when you're breeding queens. What do you? What's your top three? Uh, gentleness, uh, honey production. What what do you what do you go for? Uh, number one, they have to survive through the winter. The winter. The the bees. The hive that I'm going to going to graft out of has to survive through the winter and it has to the queen has to start laying early in the spring and build up quick in the spring i want an early quick build up out of a queen those, those are the ones that'll make you money and regardless of what breed it is uh, if they don't start if they don't start laying until mid-april that's not something i can use so i, I don't graft from, i don't raise queens from them but uh, if I want queens that are going wide open by mid-March in, in my area, which be similar to yours. Yeah. yeah. Um, first of March, maybe for you in middle of March for me, uh, I want them, I want the queens laying wide open or I'm not, I'm not going to grab from them. I don't worry about gentleness at all because that's coming mostly from the drone side. 
you want the, you want your drone colonies to be the gentle colonies. That's okay. why a lot of commercial a lot of commercial breeders use uh, Cordovan Italians for uh, their drone yards and use something else, usually three banded Italians or something like that, or maybe Minnesota Hygienics for their queen queen production yards. And they graft from the Minnesotas or, or the three banded Italians and they make those with the Cordovans because they get a nice gold colored bee. Drones control, primarily control color and temperament. And they get a really nice acting and nice colored bee, but uh, they survive good because that, that comes from the queen side. So okay. that, that's what I choose for. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we're, we're running out of questions. You got any over there in the in the chat bar? Not at the moment. There we go. We got it. Uh, Doug, you're up. Hey, how's everybody doing tonight? I'm pretty good. Um, I'm uh, been raising queens last year, following a lot of y'all's advice and a lot of chats. Had really good luck uh, till end of June about. And I started getting a lot less return on my mated queens. Um, I wasn't seeing a lot of drones around. I was wondering if y'all could talk on uh, maintaining the bee yard. How do I get them to keep giving me drones later in the season? Well, you can uh, you can force drone production, but you can't force them to keep drones in the hive. That you know you can put drone comb in a hive and stimulate the queen. You know, with some feed and get her to lay in the drone comb or you can uh, cage a virgin queen for about three weeks put her in a queen bank for about three weeks she probably never mate and she everything she lays will be a drone so i mean there's ways to to enhance the drone production but um, once they're in the hive if it gets hot and dry and there's not anything for the bees to work They'll act just like they do in the winter. They'll throw them out of the hive, throw the drones, kill the drones off, and cut their losses. But uh, I always have a a real downturn in uh, queen production in July and August. And the bees just aren't interested in raising queens in July and August. And we also begin to have more predators at that time of year. We have lots of dragonflies, especially in August. We have uh, the insectivorous birds that uh, at that time of year, they're actually beginning to, after the summer solstice, they're, the birds are beginning to feed up in preparation of going somewhere else for the winter. And they're, they're harder on bees also. I mean, there, there's a lot of predators for queens in uh, July and August that you don't have in May and June. And the bees themselves aren't really wanting to make queens either. So every year I tell myself that I'm not going to raise queens in July and August. And every year I think, I believe I can make it work this year. And every year uh, I end up telling my wife, don't let me do this again. Mm -hmm. okay. and I, I just don't have a lot of success raising queens in July and August. So uh, that's a good time to go fishing, I think. <laughs> Rather than All right. Well, I know Langford, Langford said that, uh, and I found this to be true this year because I was selling a few queens, not a lot, but uh, about the time everybody started treating after the solstice, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I had a lot of people calling wanting queens and I yeah. had quit trying. And I, is it a time, uh, September or so, to, to try to pick up yeah. a few more? Yeah, as, as, soon as, as soon as anything starts blooming again, uh, they'll raise queens on a bloom. But uh, when, when there's a dearth, which we normally have a dearth in July and August, and when there's a dearth, it's hard to raise queens. Uh, if, you, if you happen to be in a place that you've got a good honey flow in July and August, they'll probably keep raising queens. You might just have to adjust your numbers of mating nukes to uh, get the same number of queens back. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. Welcome. Uh, let's see here. Daniel, you're up. Hey, Kent. Hey. Um, what are your thoughts and opinions on um, some of the larger scale commercial treatment free guys? Um, 
Do you think that's uh, a breed of bee, like the Russian or the VSH? Um, and do you think it's a combination of integrated pest management where they're doing drone brood removal and screen bottom boards? And um, just curious to, to get your insights on how effective some of those things are or, you know, if you don't think they're worth it at all. Well, um, as far as large scale beekeepers, I don't know any what I would consider. I'm I'm calling large scale uh, three, four thousand colonies and more. Uh, I don't know anybody that's treatment free uh, or using IPM. Ever everybody that I know um, is doing something to treat for mites. Now, other you know larger than hobbyist uh, size uh beekeepers a lot of the some of those guys do go treatment free but it's uh there's two parts to that one it's extremely labor intensive because you've got to keep pulling drone brood you've got to keep breaking the brood cycle and uh you've got to do a lot of these things that are that are all labor intensive plus you've got to be good at making more bees you know th those are the two things that keep keep the non-treat uh, operations, that's the two things that keep them going. They're very labor intensive. They're on the spot with everything that they do. They do everything strictly by calendar and they know how to make more bees and they're good at it. And uh, it's, it's not that it's not a legitimate practice. It's just that it's not doable on a, on a truly commercial scale where you've got four or 5,000 colonies because it's so labor intensive. Four right, or five hundred right. colonies, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what I was thinking of. You know, like the Kirk Webster, you know, three four hundred colonies, and and the the race of bees does make a difference with that. Russians Russians will make a difference with that, but the Russians are just as susceptible to the viruses as as any other race, and uh, you know, I'm sure that Kirk has to do something to. Uh, help the bees out in knocking the row account down. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we, either got, we don't have any questions right now. You got any questions from the sidebar guys? Or from anybody? Well, here's one up. Uh, Andrew, you're up. Hey, how you doing? Um, again, Doing good. <laughs> so we've had this like crazy winter this year. It's been 50 degrees. It's been down to 30 degrees, and it's kind of holding steady at 40 and, and 30. And um, I've been feeding uh, dry pollen through the winter, um, and kind of feeding them, feeding them honey. But they're they're building strong. When we get these 60 degree days, they are. You know, they're doing their orientation flights. I was in the hive the other day. It's kind of packed. And it's a five frame nuke. And my, my worries are that they're going to start expanding before, um, before swarm season. So how would you go about – trying to explain this. Um, how am I going to add another box to that uh, five frame nuke um, – before that swarm season, do I just take a five frame box with five frames and put it on top? Should I divide the, the brood a little bit and like put them vertically? <laughs> There's my answer right there. But <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> the the best the best way to do that uh, would be to take another five frame box and put it on top. But um, you don't want to divide the brood when you're going to be getting in some cool nights. Uh, if you're pretty confident that your nights are not going to be below 50 degrees, then you can do something similar to checkerboarding and divide the brood to force the bees to work up into that second box. If you have a band of honey across the top of the top of the brood frame, they may not work up into that second box. They may sit, look at it just like a ceiling. But uh, right now, while we're still having some cool nights, best thing best thing that you could do 
uh, as far as putting another box on is just to put another box, prefer preferably with drawn comb, just as a second story on your five frame nuke and hope that they work up into it. I have just a little bit different approach than that. I put the box underneath. If it's going to be cold, I put draw comb underneath of them. It gives them a little room. That'd and, be okay. Because yeah. the heat heat rises, and I'm yeah. thinking I'm going to keep them up in the top where bees like to be when it's cold. Yeah. My preference, I ain't saying either way won't work. And and also uh, with doing it that way, putting the drawn comb on the bottom, there's no band of honey that the queen has to cross to get down into the bottom. The bees might might move down. Uh, possibly a little bit easier than they move up. That's not the way they usually move up easier than moving down. But in that case, they might they might actually go into that drawn comb a little bit easier. Neither way is wrong. Yeah, either way is wrong. There you go. Everybody's got their own. No questions right now. Somebody surely got a question. We'll look, per, we'll look pretty dumb sitting here looking at each other. What is the best? Uh, we got a question in sidebar. What is the best way uh, to get drone production high early before queen rearing time? How much earlier does the drones need to be started? The drones need to be started uh, at least two weeks earlier than your queens. It takes drones about 14 days to get uh, mature. They, some might mature a little bit earlier, some a little bit later, but that, that's kind of an average, uh, rule of thumb average. It's about two weeks before that you would start your queens or before you would need a queen mated. So uh, you can actually start them almost at the same time because it's gonna take 10 days to get a queen. Once you start the process of getting a queen, uh, it's gonna take at least 10 days. And she's probably not going to take a mating flight for another day or two after she emerges. But still, um, it's not a bad idea to start your drones one to two weeks ahead of when you're going to start your queen production. And as far as getting a lot of drones, uh, just put some drone comb in, in a normal hive. This is the time of year that queens are going to be uh, they're going to be geared up to make drones that they lay a lot of drone eggs just on their own um, at this time of year, just because that's what's needed. So uh, if you give them some drone comb to lay it in, then that's a good thing, but make sure it's drawn comb. Um, don't expect them to draw a drone frame out for you at this time of year. They might, might not. That, that's uh, how to get, early drones somebody somebody else jason may have a better better method of doing it uh that's just the way that i do it you got anything to add to that jason you want to or no um depending on where you're at in my neck of the woods i'm pretty high elevation i'm about 2400 feet i'm not far from snowshoe mountain um so we have snow up to mid-April or so and I have an old barn out on the end of the point away from my nuke yard and I'll put colonies I'll winter call some colonies along the back wall of that barn and have PVC exits out to back wall of the barn and it stays slightly eh, 10 15 degrees warmer in there all the time no <laughs> winds hitting it and um, a lot of times I'll put drone frames in those early on and those will get laid up before other stuff, like especially the colonies outside. So that helps some in the colder weather to get earlier drones. Yep. In the summertime, I, I, I have put drone comb down in a strong colony later in the summer and put a drone, broad drone frame right in the middle of the brood nest and put a queen excluder over the top with nothing else, no other frames in the rest of them all full of honey or a lot of birds so she can't have anything to lay in and i get her to lay up a, a you know brood, a drone frame in a couple days you know that's about all it takes them yeah that's later in the year i don't start them out early that way don't work very well in early early time okay ernest uh you're up ernest you're up 
Okay. Uh, I was thinking if, if you bring uh, drones in uh, uh, from, uh, say, the south or a warmer area into, uh, uh, say, climates like we have, will those drones actually uh, mate or does the temperature have anything to do with it? Well, they'll, if, if, they can, if it's warm enough that they can fly, they'll still mate. You can like you can bring in a package of bees from South Georgia, and uh, install a package, and those, those drones will mate the queens that are. If you have queens ready to be mated, taking mating flights, those drones will will mate the queens. Um, the only thing, the temperature, only part it plays. There is a little bit of a shock to the system, but uh, if if they're out flying, they've overcome that, and the only part that the temperature would play is if it's too cool for them to fly, which uh, then they're not going to, they're not going to find a congregation area. Okay. Well, thank you. We, well, got a, we got a question in the sidebar for someone just getting started. What do you recommend for foundation? Well, I, I recommend that uh, I want them to be just as miserable as I was when I started. So, uh, <laughs> you need the you need ripple wire foundation with with hooks in the wire, uh, in wooden frames, and uh, cross wire the frames. If you have deep, well, whether you have deep or medium frames, cross wire the frames. And uh, at the end of that, you'll uh, see why the plastic frame industry has gone so crazy <laughs> your, your fingers will be like pin cushions from handling that wire and uh, but you, you need them cross wired or they're likely to warp when you put them into a hive and bees won't ever draw them straight if they ever warp but uh, beeswax foundation if you're just starting the bees are gonna they're gonna prefer the pure wax foundation over plastic plastic is easier but um, if you're just starting, you don't want to. I don't want you to get discouraged right off by the bees not drawing comb on your on your frames. So use use the beeswax foundation. I, and I just prefer the ripple wired foundation because it's a little bit more sturdy. And uh, then I cross wire. Downside to that is you can't make comb honey with ripple wired foundation. <laughs> Now, not, uh, for, this works for anybody if they use plastic. You can uh, just take your plastic foundation and lay it on top. Instead of using your inner cover, just yeah. lay, lay that on top of your frames on 10 frame box and close them up. Leave it in there for a week. They'll, they'll nasty comb all over it. Take it out, scrape it, scrape it off, and then put it in, and they'll draw it right now. Hmm. It really, it really helps. I mean, they're wasting that wax anyway. Let them yeah. let them wax it for it for you. They'll have propolis there and just scrape it and then, and then put them in the frames. That's on a smaller outfit. I mean, I understand yeah. a commercial guy can't do that. Yeah. But it does get them to draw frames. Uh, Chris, friend of ours here, he's on here from Australia. Yeah. He says that and it works really well. I can see how it would. Yeah. Uh, no questions. Got any more questions on the sidebar? No, at the moment. There we go. Doug, you're up. I got plenty of questions. I'm. I'll get over <laughs> shyness. Um, yeah. I, I started growing my bees last year. Like I said, uh, I got up about. Uh, I think I, I sold a bunch off, but I kept about sixty-five five frames in the backyard. Uh, a third of an acre in Charlotte, North Carolina, made the neighbors real happy. Um, we're moving to about three acres, but it's about an hour and 20 away. I got to move all these bees, and I've never moved bees. They came in in two packages when I started, and I've never moved bees. Um, and I have a Subaru, and I have a Jeep Wrangler, and a four by six trailer. So I'm debating, should I just rent a U-Haul What's uh, any idea? Everything's in five frame nukes. Um, I got everything busted down to single pretty much. So um, I'm thinking about just strapping them and putting them on the trailer. So, uh, so how far are you moving them? 
about an hour and 20 minutes. Okay. Um, you, you can strap them on a trailer. They'll, they'll ride easier in a, in a vehicle than they would on a trailer, but they'll ride on a trailer too. Um, bees move better. Uh, it's, it's not as hard on the bees moving. If you leave the front door open on the, on the nukes where they can come out on the porch or come out and check things out. Um, if you close that up, even if they have ventilation, sometimes they panic if they don't feel like, if they feel like they're trapped, but, um, a good moving net for, you know, for, uh, hobbyist or, or small scale beekeeping or the shade cloths that you would get from, from a livestock supply or greenhouse supply, get about an 80% shade cloth and you can uh, throw it, throw it over the, throw it over the nukes, leave the doors open. And it's, it's unlikely that you'll lose any of them that way. You probably won't lose them anyway, traveling that short of a distance, but, uh, Moving them with a net's just a lot easier on the bees than it is closing them up. But you won't have any trouble strap them, strap them down where they won't bounce. You know they won't be bouncing all over the place. <laughs> and and uh, move them on the trailer. And try not I would to I would suggest you move them at night. Yeah, move. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Night. night. Is uh, there a temperature I should look for? We're still getting yeah. a little cool here, but we're still. I think next week we're going to be probably lows in the 40s hopefully well, that, that would that would be okay if as, as long as the temperature is not down 35 or lower uh you're not taking that big of a risk with the bees the risk in moving in cold weather is that you're moving in say you're moving at 25 degrees and you especially on a single axle trailer uh it bounces and it shakes the cluster loose and they get down on the bottom board and you'll lose a lot of bees that well, I mean, a lot of individual bees, not a lot of colonies, but you'll lose a lot of individual bees when they shake down on the bottom board out of the cluster because they won't ever get back up into the cluster at 25 degrees. At 45, they will. They'll, they'll come back up into the cluster. So it's not as it's not as hazardous when your lows are in the 40s. Okay, I've run everything like uh, David over at Barnyard. Everything's in five frame Advantex with the screen yeah. mesh on the front. So I can yeah. shut the door and it's, you know, they're still wide open, but they yeah. can't really come yeah. out. You, you'll be okay just doing that. Okay. And should I put a sock? Cause I run the feet, high top feeders. So I'm going to take those off. Should I just cut like a, a single flat top yeah. or should I make a screen cover? Just a flat top? Um, screen covers are safer, but um, a flat top will probably be okay too in, in cool weather. Okay. The main thing, uh, one of the main things I think about hauling bees, especially if you're home in the daytime, you just don't want to stop. If you stop yeah. very long, uh, you've got them all shook up, you're beating them around, the hives are pretty full, and they'll overheat in, in 20 minutes. You'll lose a bunch yep. of hives. They really go quick. All right. My plan was to go at night. I was going to shut them up, you know, and then load them up and... Uh, I'm well, still good. young enough. I'll stay up late and drive in the middle of the night so everybody can get up and set up. And then when they wake up in the morning, they'll just be at a new spot wondering what the hell happened. Heck, pardon me, what happened. But um, they'll figure it out. If they can go to almonds, I guess they'll figure it out. Sure. You, you'll be okay. Yeah, Moving them like that, you'll be okay. But, yeah. you know, um, anytime, you anytime you move bees, you stand a chance of losing at least 10% of them. So – you know, don't be shocked if you lose a couple. That it, it happens. That's, that's just that's just the way it is. Some hives, when you get them upset over any little thing, uh, first thing that happens is they, they kill the queen, and and don't make another one. Uh, that's usually how the how the losses happen. But uh, uh, you'll be all right. I mean, you're you're doing the right thing. You're doing it the right way. The uh, the worst thing we signed the contract on the house, all excited, went to look, and they had a timber operation across the street, sixty seven acres. They took out immediately. I'm like heartbroken. Like, come on, I needed those trees. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, there, I think there, there'll be a lot of foliage there though in two years. That'll grow up underneath there, underneath them trees. It'll be yeah, it'll be a haven for the bees. Oh yeah, briars and hedge bushes make a lot of honey. 
Mm-hmm. Any ideas what you would uh, – I'm thinking about making some seed bombs and shoot them over there with that old wrist rocket. <laughs> Any ideas? I mean, I was just thinking some uh, some butterfly weed and some corn, corn flour to kind of aggravate everybody, but I like the way it looks. <laughs> well, there's, there's lots of good stuff that you could uh, plant for bees. Anything in the mustard family, bees like it. Uh, anything in the mint family, bees like it. Anything in the holly family, you know. All, all of that bees really like. All the best beekeeping plants or bee plants are, are highly invasive. And I could tell you a few things that'd be great to put over there, but uh, the extension service would really frown at it. Oh, I watch I watch y'all's videos and pay attention. I got an idea on a couple of them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw something out. Excellent. Well, y'all, I appreciate y'all. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jimmy, you're up. Oh, I'm a, all right. Well, I, I I raised my hand because nobody else was. So That's I, fine. I had to raise it. But I had a question on the B school. You having a B school again this year? Around April, April. April nine. April nine, ten, and eleven. Nine, ten, eleven. Yeah. I think we're planning on coming up. So I just want to cool. get the dates. Get the dates uh, down. And anybody, anybody can come. Bring family. Bring kids. Doesn't matter. Uh, everybody's welcome. It don't cost nothing. We feed good. And all the days are the same, right, Friday? All the days are the same. Uh, all the days will have the same information and same uh, hands-on right. stuff, but uh, each day has has the ability to be unique because uh, we, we cater to the people that are there. And if somebody happens to be there one day that wants to practice dissecting and looking at stuff under a microscope, that's what we'll do. Okay. We'll, we'll break out. We have enough people doing classes they will break somebody out and and do that. So what, whatever you want to do, that's what we'll do. Okay. Along Sounds with good. along with a lot of splits, nukes, queen rearing, uh, pest and disease identification, inspection of hives, swarm catching, all that kind of stuff. Mm. Sounds good. Mm. Randall, uh, I don't see a microphone for you. It doesn't look like your mic's turned on. If you can't get it turned on. You'll have to. Uh, uh, type it in the chat down there. Yeah, awesome. I'll take another question here while you wait and see if you can get your mic turned on. Don't see that you have one on. Uh, Andrew, you're you're up. Hey, um, this piggybacks the previous question is how many? Uh, it's hard to answer this, but about how many hives can you have in an area before they start depleting the resources? I mean, what's a good way to tell when you're kind of beyond the threshold? Well, that's uh, that's totally dependent on the forage in your area. Where I live in West Kentucky, about the max, uh, right where I live, where my farm is, is about two dozen hives. You're just wasting your time putting more than that in, an, in a bee yard because uh, two dozen hives might average 45, 50 pounds of honey. If you put four dozen there, they'll average 20 pounds of honey. I mean, there's only so much resources to go around, and it's going to be spread out amongst the hives, especially the bigger ones. But uh, uh, where we have bees in in South Mississippi, you can put 100 hives in a bee yard and not be stretching the resources just because there's so much more forage in in that area. And the way that you find out is uh, school of hard knocks. You know, you, you put uh, you put 20 hives in a bee yard, and uh, if all of them just make a bumper crop of honey, then you put 30 in there next year, and you you push the envelope until you get to, you reach the threshold, and you figure out just exactly uh, how many you can keep in a spot. And ask some other beekeepers in your area. I mean, that's a good way to good way to figure out, especially beekeepers that have been doing it for a long time, uh, ask what their average honey crop is and what the honey flow is. You know, they'll probably give you a pretty good clue on how many you can keep. They'll probably tell me one hive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, maybe, maybe it'll be more than one. That's pretty poor forage if you just keep, keep one. Um, if you have multiple bee yards, uh, how far, like, or how close 
together would you put those? Like, well, three, be- three to four miles is what we try to – we try to keep our bee yards three to four miles apart. Uh, our bees usually forage – and yours will too. Your bees will usually forage anywhere from a half mile to a mile and a half away from the hive. Now they, they can go two miles. They can go five miles if there's nothing any closer for them to work. But they're only efficient at about half mile to a mile and a half from the hive. They're efficient at bringing nectar and pollen back in. They'll survive, but they won't they won't uh, make a good crop for you if, if you have forage that's farther away. So from that, you know, we get the three, three to four miles apart. Is we try to keep them. Okay. Uh, uh, we, did Randall get the question typed in down there? No, and we've got a couple of questions over okay, there. Okay, go ahead. So, let me get that there. One second. What are the most common ways to break the brood cycles to help with varroa control? Uh, the most common way to break the brood cycle to help with varroa control is to just remove the queen from the hive. Um, if you remove the queen from the hive by making making a nuke with her, you're not breaking the brood cycle in, in the frames you're using to make the nuke, usually a two frame nuke, but the hive that you took her from you're going to need to tear out queen cells at about uh, four days from when you take her away for well more than that about a week from when you take her out of the hive uh, destroy the queen cells in it leave her out of that hive for 10 days anyway and then that that will break the brood cycle where that the oxalic acid will be a really good control for varroa mites that way and it's also a good control for some other diseases, uh, bacterial diseases too, to break the brood cycle like that. But um, that, that's the most common way. The other common way is to cage the queen, but you'll leave her in a cage, but leave her in that hive. And chances are you won't have to tear out queen cells, but you still need to be aware you might have some. But uh, cage, the, just catch the queen, put her in a cage, some people use a, a little square screen that they just push into the comb and keep the queen under that with some workers. Uh, the screen would uh, normally will uh, have a queen excluder on it for that the workers can come and go through it and leave the queen under it. Uh, that's another way of breaking the brood cycle. Main thing is, is uh, the brood cycle needs to be broken at least at least as long as worker brood is going to be capped, which is 11 days. And that's uh, that's just kind of rule of thumb stuff for breaking the brood cycle. Uh, the next one in the, in the chat window is, what are your thoughts on single hive management, meaning queen excluders over 10 frame boxes with additional boxes added as needed? That's pretty common practice um, where we keep bees. At, for honey production hives. It, in our production hives, we run a 10 frame single with a queen excluder and then a 10 frame, uh, well, sometimes 10 frame. If we're using it for a honey super, we use nine, to eight to nine frames in a 10 frame box and uh, use, that, uh, use that as a honey super above the queen excluder because uh, hives that we winter, we winter in singles and they they just winter better in singles with uh, a sugar pad on top of them rather than leaving a lot of honey on them. They they tend to winter better, and we have a, a lot higher survival rate compared to a double deep full of honey. So uh, that's uh, that's what I I think it's a great idea, but uh, you have to be prepared for it because. Uh, you have to make sure that the bottom box don't have a lot of honey in it to start with. And the way to get that out of there is to scratch the honey open and put drawn comb above the queen excluder so the bees will move that up. And when you do that, it uh, it works pretty good. And I know that the standard standard for most people is a double deep and then honey supers on top of that. And w- with beekeeping, there's lots of different ways of doing it, and uh, 
none of them are absolutely wrong. It's just your personal preference. And I used to run double deeps all the time. Now I run a single and we make, uh, we make a lot more honey and we make a lot more bees and we keep them alive better. So that's, uh, it's also easier to find the queen when you need her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got any more on there, Todd? That's all. Okay. Uh, I got one more question here and we're going to call it, wrap it up for the night. Uh, let's see. KP, you're up. Yeah, how can we get in touch with you about the uh, get together you have you you're talking about? Uh, I got a cell number I'll give you. I don't mind anybody having it. Uh, and I get texted at that number too. It's 270 970 1307. Okay. And. Uh, I can always pick up a text. I can't always get a phone call. Our our cell service is a little bit spotty here. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, we got another one here. It snuck in on us. Uh, Floyd, you're up. Yeah. Hey, Kent. Hey. Uh, I came down to your B school a year or two ago from Michigan. Really enjoyed myself. Anybody hey, I remember you. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm looking to get into raising some queens. Now, you're not finishing your uh, queens in a finisher, are you? No. Uh, our our queens are finished in mating nukes, actually, for the most part. And we, uh, we either finish the queens in the same cell builder that we start them in. We use it as a starter and finisher or... I pull the cells at two days and put them direct, put a cell directly into a mating nuke and let the mating nuke finish it. We use four frame mating nukes and there's plenty of bees in there to finish a queen cell if you put a two day cell in there. And that uh, streamlines our queen rearing a lot. It, it turns everything around a lot faster for us. Could I put two four frame nukes over a queen excluder and or to help with the heat uh you could i mean you don't even really have to put them over a queen excluder you can uh if, if you had a screen bottom board on the four frame nukes and you just set them on top of uh on on top of the frames on a on a 10 frame hive uh that that would work you'd catch the heat uh, there's a lot of heat transfer just through the bottom, through the bottom of the box, so you don't uh, you don't really have to expose them through the queen excluder. The reason I I had rather not put them over a queen excluder like that if it was mine, is uh, you're taking a chance of the queen that's in the bottom box pulling a lot of bees out of that nuke that uh, should be up there taking care of the queen cell. Oh, okay. Because uh, she's, thought... she's already laying. You know, that queen in that bottom box is already laying. There's a lot of pheromone down there that's not in that mating nuke. So. Right. I, I was going to bring brood up with the, the split. And I, I was yeah. thinking that be, nurse bees from the bottom would come up to help. Not so? Well, some, yeah, some will. Um, but that queen is going to hold a lot of the nurse bees down there also so i mean it it's uh it, they might and they might not i mean that's one of those uncertain things about beekeeping um but if there's no queen in the bottom they for sure will mm -hmm. they'll come up there for sure to take care of uncapped brood there'll be a certain number of bees that come up there anyway but you might not get a full nuke out of it you might not have the warmth up there you know the heat the uh, the thermal regulation that you needed. Yeah, uh, and getting the heat is why I was thinking about trying to make them nukes up over top the larger hive. Yeah, well, that's not I a mean, bad idea. it's still idea. pretty chilly up here. Yeah, I imagine. That's not a bad <laughs> idea. You could put your nukes just on top of the hive and then wrap it, wrap the whole thing and put, put a cover on top of all of it, and that, that would hold a lot of heat in. Okay, well, thank you very much. Welcome.
Mm. Joe, I know you said just a couple more questions, or yeah. that was the last one. Randall no. did get his question in, if you have time for it. Yeah, we got time. I just we're going to getting close to an hour and a half. I've got to get her shut off there. Yeah, yeah. So, with your operation, what guidelines do you follow for changing out your queens? Um, I, I change out queens by by renting bees for pollination. Um, <laughs> you almost have a built-in guideline because it's really hard on bees pollination because you're getting one kind of pollen coming in and unless you're talking about almond pollen uh, almond pollen is fairly complete it's a pretty good pollen but when you're talking about watermelon pollen that's a whole different animal and uh, you're going to have failing queens in watermelons and we just make sure that we uh, we make sure that we keep a laying queen when a queen stops laying it, it's usually because of pollen we put a new one in and uh, that that's the criteria that I use in changing queens when they when they stop being productive uh, we change queens we put a new queen in okay got one more here Can, Doug right. you're up uh, hey I just wanted to thank all of you Joe Kent uh, Langford does Welcome. a lot of videos Jason y'all take a lot of time out and put a lot of effort to it, and it's really invaluable, and I really do appreciate all y'all do. Hope everybody has a good night. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Kent, thanks for coming on. We'll see you here in about a couple months, and we'll have all a right. good old time, and appreciate everybody come watching. I hope you learned something, and this one, I ain't going to say, this might be the last chat for the winter. Things are going to start heating up here real quick in the next three weeks for me, and, and Kent knows he's been shipping bees all over, and everybody – getting busy i'll try to get videos one a week up i hope this summer uh just depends on got a big bait in the yard new mate in the yard i gotta take care of and hope that i get some videos out there and see how, how i'm setting it up and going so appreciate everybody coming thanks mm. sure.